devils occupy the space which separates heaven from earth. This constitutes the link which unites the universe with itself. The divinity never enters into direct contact with man, which is done through the mediation of the devils with whom the gods have dealings and which reoccupy themselves with both during waking and sleeping. In ancient times, the word daimon, from which the term evil was derived, was not used in the bad sense as it is today, nor was it used exclusively for evil beings, but for spirits in general, within which were included superior beings called gods, as well as the less celebrated, the actual devils, who communicated directly with man. Spiritism also says that spirits inhabit space, that God only communicates with man, through the intermediary of pure spirits who are entrusted to transmit his wishes. Spirits also communicate with man during sleep as well as while he is awake. If we put the word spirit in the place of the word devil, we have the spiritist doctrine, and by putting the word angel, we have the Christian doctrine. The constant preoccupation of the philosophers, as understood by Socrates and Plato, to take great care of the soul, less with respect to the present life, which lasts but an instant, but more with respect to eternity. As the soul is immortal, would it not be more prudent to live our lives bearing this fact in mind? Both Spiritism and the Christian faith teach the same thing. If the soul is immaterial, then after this life it will have to go to a world which is equally invisible and immaterial, the same way as the body decomposes and returns to matter. It is very important, however, to clearly distinguish the pure soul, which is truly immaterial and which nourishes itself, as God does, from the thoughts and the sciences, from that of the soul which is more or less stained by the impurities of a material nature, which in peak elevation to all that is divine and which in fact causes it to be retained in its earthly surroundings. As we can see, both Socrates and Plato understood perfectly the different levels of the dematerialized soul. They insisted on the varieties of situations resulting from its more or less purified state. What they said through intuition Spiritism proves by the numerous examples which it places before us. If death meant the complete dissolution of man, the bad spirits would have much to gain from death, as they would find themselves at one at the same time free from the body, soul and vices. Only those who adorn their soul not with strange ornaments, but with those which are appropriate, may await the hour of their return to the other world with tranquillity. This is equal to saying that materialism, when it proclaims there is nothing after death, annuls all previous moral responsibilities, this being consequentially an inductive to badness, and that badness has everything to gain from nothingness. Only the man who has rid himself of all vice and enriched himself with virtue can await the arousing in the other life with tranquillity, I mean with examples which are offered to us daily, spiritism shows how painful it is for those who are bad to pass over into this other life. The body retains the well and perfect vestiges of the care it received, as well as the marks of all accidents suffered. The same applies to the soul. When it disposes of the body, it maintains in evidence the features of its character, its affections, as well as the marks that have been left on it by all the various occurrences during its life. Thus, the worst thing that can happen to a man or woman is to return to the other world with his or her soul laden with crimes. You see, Caliphants, that neither you nor Pollux nor Georges can prove that we should lead a different life that could be useful when we find ourselves on the other side. From so many opinions, the one, the only one which is unshakable, that it's better to receive than to commit an injustice, and that, above all else, we must be careful not to just seem like, but to actually be men and women of goodness. Here we are faced with yet another point of capital importance, which experience has proved to us, that the soul which is not yet purified retains the idea, 
tendencies, character, and passions which it had while on earth. It is not the maxim that it is better to receive than to commit an injustice. Entirely Christian, Jesus expressed the same thought when he said, If someone strikes you on the cheek, then offer him the other one too. One of two things. Either death is the absolute destruction, or is the passing of the soul into another place. If everything is extinguished, then death would be like one of those infrequent nights when we do not dream nor have any consciousness of ourselves. However, if death is but a change of habitation, the passage which the place where the dead must meet, that happiness is to find there all those we have known, my greatest pleasure will be to closely examine the inhabitants of this other home, and to distinguish there, as we do here, which of those who deem themselves worthy are actually so considered. But it is time to part, me to my death, and you to love. According to Socrates, those who live upon the earth meet again after death and recognize each other. Spiritism shows that relationships continue to the extent that death is not an interruption nor the cessation of life, but rather an, an inevitable transformation without any discontinuity. If Socrates and Plato had known what Christ was to teach 500 years later, and which spiritism now spreads, they would have said exactly the same thing. There is nothing surprising in this fact, however, if we consider that all great truths are eternal, and all advanced spirits had to know them before they came to earth, in order to be able to deliver them. We may conceive it even further, that Socrates and Plato, together with all the other great philosophers of those great times, could have later been among those chosen to uphold Christ in his divine mission, being chosen precisely because they were more apt to understand his sublime teachings. It also appears highly probable that today they participate in the host of spirits charged with teaching mankind these same truths. Never return one injustice with another, nor harm anyone, whatever harm they may have caused unto others. Few, however, will admit this principle, and those who disagree will, beyond doubt, do nothing but despise one another. And it is not the principle of charity which prescribes that we do not return evil for evil, and that we forgive our enemies. We know the tree according to its fruit. Every action should be qualified by what it produces qualified it as evil when it causes evil and as goodness when it produces goodness. The maxim, it is by the fruits that we know the tree, is repeated many times throughout the gospel. Witches are a great danger. Every man who loves riches does not love himself, nor those who belong to him. The most beautiful prayers and the most beautiful sacrifices mean less to God than a virtuous soul who has struggled to be like him. It has been a grave error to think that God dispenses more attention to their offerings than to our souls. If that were the case, then the greatest culprits would become favorite, but no, the truly just and upright are those who by their words and deeds, fulfill their duties to the gods and humanity. We call he who loves his body more than his soul depraved. Love is everywhere in nature, and it calls us to use our intelligence. We even find it in the movements of the planets. It is love which covers nature with its richest carpet. It makes its home where there are flowers and perfumes. It is also love which gives peace to mankind, calms the sea, silences the storm, and gives sleep to sufferers. Love, which will unite man through a fraternal link, is a consequence of Plato's theory on universal love as a law of nature. Socrates said, Love is neither a god nor a mortal, but a great devil that is, a great spirit which presides over universal love, this proposition was held against him like a crime. 
virtue cannot be taught, but comes as a gift from God to those who possess it. This is almost the Christian doctrine of grace, but if virtue is a gift from God, then it is a favour, and we may ask why is it not considered to all? On the other hand, if it is a gift, then there is no merit on the part of those who possess it. Spiritism is more explicit in saying that those who possess a virtue have acquired it through their own efforts during successive lives by ridding themselves, little by little, of their imperfections. Grace is a force which God gives to a well-meaning man or woman so that he or she may expunge their badness and so be able to practice good. The natural disposition shown by all is to perceive our defects far less than we see those of others. The Gospel says, You see the mote that is in the eye of your neighbor, but you do not see the beam that is in your own eye. If doctors are unsuccessful in treating the majority of ailments, it is because they are, they are treating the body without treating the soul. If the whole is not in good condition, then it is impossible that part of it should be well. Spiritism offers the key to the relationship which exists between the soul and the body, so proving that one of them is constantly reacting on the other. This idea opens up a new field for science, with the possibility of showing the real cause of certain ailments. The way of curing them becomes easier. When science takes into account the spiritual element of the organism, then failures will be much less frequent. All men, right from infancy, commit far more badness than goodness. In this sentence, Socrates touches on the grave question of the predominance of badness on earth, a question which is insoluble without knowledge of the plurality of the world and the destiny of our planet Earth, inhabited as it is by only a fraction of humanity. Only Spiritism can resolve this question, which is more fully explained in several chapters of this book. It is more judicious not to suppose you know that of which you are in ignorance. This is directed at those who offer criticism about matters unknown to them. Even in basic terms, Plato complete, completes this talk of Socrates by saying, In first place, if it is possible, we must make them more honest in their words. If they are not, we shall not bother with them, and we shall seek nothing but the truth. We shall do our best to instruct them, for we shall not insult them. This is how spiritism should proceed in relation to those who contradict whether in good or bad faith. If Plato were to come alive today, he would find things almost as they were in his time, and he would be able to use the same words. Socrates would also meet creatures who would jeer at his belief in spirits, and would believe him to be mad, together with his disciple Plato. It was for having professed these principles that Socrates saw himself ridiculed, accused of impiety, and condemned to drink hemlock. So assuredly, by reason of its controversy stirring up many prejudices, and striking again many prejudices, these new great truths will not be accepted without a fight, and not without making martyrs.